Talk Show. Recorded live. I'd like to welcome everyone to this Wednesday, February 19, 2014 edition of Money Banking and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce. I'm your host, Christian Walters. Welcome to NTT as New Trust Technology. Welcome to the revival of the study of equity, its principles, doctrines, and rules of equity in opposition to the tendency of giving an undue prominence and a superiority to purely legal rules and ignoring, forgetting, or the suppression of equitable notions. And welcome to a crier in the wilderness. Hear ye, hear ye, take notice. God's court is now in session for repent, for the Lord's kingdom and its enforcement is near. We left off on section 1052 in Palmeray's volume 3 on page 308 in the PDF or page 2401 in the book. That's section 1052, number 7, wrongful acquisition of trust property by trustee or other fiduciary person, section 1052. First, take notice of acknowledgement with agreement that this show and or documents is a private confidential arrangement not to be construed or relied upon as being legal advice for an individual legal situation or employed for making a legal decision. You will not use any of this information for making a legal decision or performing a legal procedure as not a substitute for legal advice and or guidance by a licensed attorney. This private show and or documents are for academic and informational purposes only to be used at your own risk without liability to Christian Walters. By accessing or reviewing this show or using the documents therein, you understand with agreement that with all rights reserved without prejudice, Christian Walters is not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or any other state and has not given legal advice or accepted fees for legal advice, provided no assistance, advising, or guidance of any kind of for use of non-attorneys or pro se parties in preparation or use of hearing reference, and has no interest in any use reference therein, and is not a party to this or any action arising from, and is only acting as an authorized capacity as liaisons to communications between the parties. By reading and or using this information, you acknowledge and agree you are not a client of Christian Walters. These documents and or show recordings are incomplete and void without this notice agreement being attached here and by reference and a breach of this agreement. Upon breach of this agreement, the breaching party becomes liable for commercial damages of $200 million or more per stultification or impairment per Christian Walter's discretion. Thank you for your understanding. So now on to what equity is, and equity definition, I can think of no other than John Bouvier, Institutes of American Law, 1882, Volume 2, Section 3724, Paragraph 4, which explains what equity is. It states that, quote, law is nothing without equity, and equity is everything, even without law. Now, that one opening statement right there explains it all. That's about the only thing that you really need to know. Continuing on, those who perceive what is just and what is unjust only through the eyes of law never see as well as those behold it with the eyes of equity. In other words, you've got to put the eyes of equity on to have the discernment. Back into the text, the law may be looked upon in some manner as an assistance for those who have weak perception of right and wrong in the same way that optical glasses are useful for those who are short-sighted or whose visual organs are deficient. Equity, in its true and genuine meaning, is the soul and spirit of the law. Positive law is construed, and rational law is made by it. John Bouvier, Institutes of American Law, 1882, Volume 2, Section 3724, Paragraph 4. That man knew and understood equity. And by the way, that's the court dictionary that they use written by him, Bouvier's Law Dictionary. So remember, it doesn't matter how many people don't believe it. What matters is whether it's true or not. If you believe it hard enough, doesn't make it true. It has to be true, whether you're believing on it or not. In 
and out of my pet peeve, which is public versus private, which nobody has the discernment to really know what is private, the kingdom of private is really the kingdom of God. But the definition of private would be, private is any relation that you imply or express which is your intent as a special one. And the next, when did you ever express with your intent to form any relation as a special one? And the answer to that is never. So consequently, all your relations are all public and you just don't know it. So what is this special this special relation? Well, that's what NTT is all about, New Trust Technology, because this special relation is through NTT, New Trust Technology is showing you how to set up a special relation, which is a private relation. It's how to establish a private trust, how to create the records, how to present it, how to administer it, and what jurisdiction does it ride in? Where does the enforcement come? That's what NTT is all about, this private side, the true private side, not the one everybody calls as private. Because you just can't say this is a private relation. No, that doesn't make it a private relation. So all this choosing here, when you got the choice of two or more things, the thing that you choose weighs the others or substitutes for all the others, which is Section 463 in Palmer, right? Doctrine of Election. So this intent to form a relation, now, let's talk a little more about intent. Because you just can't say, well, it's my intent to form a private relation. No, I'm afraid not. That's not what everybody was going to recognize. That doesn't demonstrate your intent. So what does demonstrate your intent? Well, that's the LGBA case versus Bellevue Farms, and this is out of a Maryland appellate case, 2011, so it's fairly recent. Court of Special Appeals of Maryland. They're giving reference to Austin Wakeman Scott, who wrote the Law's Trust in Section 2.8 at 50, which states, is to be noticed that an express trust may arise even though the parties in their own minds did not intend to create a trust. So where's the intent to create a trust then? Back into the text, it says, it is the manifestation of intention that controls and not the actual intention, where that differs from the manifestation of intention. An express trust may be created even though the parties do not call it a trust, and here is the bingo, and even though they do not understand precisely what a trust is. So you don't have to understand precisely what a trust is. So it's like hitting a home run out of the ballpark for the first time. You've never been at bat, never did any practice. says it is sufficient of what they appear to have in mind is in its essentials what the courts mean when they speak of a trust. And what is a trust after all? It's just whatever it is in trust to T, granted to T, in trust for B. T is trustee, B is beneficiary. That's all it is. It's a duty with the trustee for a third party. And when there's a duty impressed and it's vested for a third party, you have a trust, even though you might not know what you're doing, you're forming a trust. So how easy it is to enter into trust, especially when you don't understand what a trust is. But it's this manifestation of intention. What is that? That's your actions, actions and your deeds. Put down on a piece of paper. You recorded what your actions, what you did. That's a deed. A deed is your action. Recorded on a piece of paper. That piece of paper, that record, that's what controls. And not your actual intention, where that's your actual knowing what you were doing. You don't have to actually know what you're doing. It's whether or not you've created the record that's the manifestation of attention. That's what controls. And if you 
create a trust that has the pass the trust test, which is there's there's uh, four elements in a trust. Intent, number one, two, purpose, three, parties, and the three consists of grantor, trustee, and beneficiary, three parties or three office heads. That's it. Intent, purpose, parties, number three, and four, specific trust res identifiable. Just about any kind of collateral, whether it be uh, intellectual property, or actual physical property. That's collateral, trust res. That's four. And then we include a fifth one in there, which is a method of formation, say delivery of, of the res. If you have the first four there, intent, purpose, party, specific trust res, you have a trust. That passes the trust test. Now, you'd have to enforce the trust. You'd have to be knowing to enforce it. So you'll have to have actual intention. You will have to have the manifestation of intention that controls the records. And that's what NTT is all about. I'll teach you how to create the records that controls. And any time that you have a conflict between two jurisdictions of equity and at law, the Decatur Act specifies that the priority is that equity always wins. And that's codified in many rules of many states, usually in the scope and title section at the beginning. Now, let's talk a little about equity being confused with other jurisdictions, like common law. In the Adams quote of the origin, origin of English equity, Adams wrote, quote, we may confidently assert that equity and common law originated in one and the same procedure. In other words, they were commingled in everyone's mind due to a lack of understanding that they were separate jurisdictions. So everybody thought back then, and as well as today, their understanding is, Equity is what they want, really, uh, but they don't know it's equity what they're asking for. And they've got that mixed up that that's common law. So everybody in common law wants the unwritten part. And if you ask them what the unwritten part is in common law that you want, they will tell you back, well, we want what's fair, just, and right. Well, that's the definition of equity, what's fair, just, and right. And here they're asking for equity, but they're thinking it's common law. Adams wrote that we may confidently assert that equity and common law originated one and the same procedure, that during the first 200 years of their history, they were not distinguished from one another. And that's what you must do in your mind, distinguish them as separate. They're not commingled. You, have, you must segregate them. They're different jurisdictions, and one has priority over the other one. As the, the quote for Bouvier points out, it's equity that created common law. It's equity that creates all the jurisdictions of law. In fact, Equity is the law, period. It's the statutes and codes of the common law or the other jurisdictions that is the enforcement of the equity when you don't do it. It's like the Ten Commandments, the common law, the statutes and codes, all synonymous there, common law, statutes and codes, uh, Ten Commandments, all the same thing. That's the judgment side. That's like the iceberg, the one-tenth of the iceberg that you see on top. That's what you see. The statutes and codes, the common law, the Ten Commandments. But the biggest part of the iceberg is underneath. The nine-tenths of it is underneath, which you don't see. Well, that unwritten part that you don't see, that's equity. So the nine-tenths, and the one-tenth comprise the whole iceberg. But the part that you only understand and see is the common law or the statute and code of the Ten Commandments, which is the enforcement of the judgment side of the nine-tenths underneath which you don't see, the principles on which the iceberg rests. The main part of it, the nine-tenths of it. 
but you've got to view the law as being the nine-tenths equity plus the one-tenth enforcement, statutes and codes, common law, the judgment, Ten Commandments. That's all the one-tenth. The nine-tenths is equity, the principles upon which that's all been founded. See, we have a confusion of what law really is. We're trying to separate them into different jurisdictions and keep them segregated. No, there's only one law, the law of equity, period. And it has its enforcement called Ten Commandments or Statutes and Codes. Now, for the one-tenth, Statutes and Code of the common law or the judgment side, it must be reflecting equity to be a true one-tenth part of it. If it's not, then it has no part in it, and it's not part of it. So you must clearly distinctly keep them distinguished from one another. It says it is well on into the 14th century before we get any clear distinction between equity and common law. Equity is the spirit of the law. That's the broad view of the intent of any interpretation of any law, not the narrow view. It's your definition of what law is and what the spirit of the law is. Section 1052, wrongful acquisition of trust property by trustee or other fiduciary person. In several of the preceding subdivisions, the trustee, by means of trust funds, has acquired property from a third person, which thereby becomes subject to the original trust. The present species includes all the various instances in which the trustee or other fiduciary person wrongfully acquires the title and beneficial use of the very trust property itself. The property and species which forms the Subject matter of the trust. The doctrine may be stated in its most general form that whenever a trustee or person person closed with any fiduciary character takes advantage of the relation and by means of it acquires the title or use of the trust property or makes a profit or or advantage to himself out of the trust and confidence, then a constructive trust is impressed upon such property, profits, or proceeds in his hands in the favor of the original beneficiary. The following are some of the most important applications of this doctrine. When a trustee, administrator, agent, attorney, or other fiduciary person, without the knowledge or consent of his beneficiary, purchases the trust property at a public or private sale, or when, by taking advantage of the trust and confidence reposed, and of the superiority conferred upon him by the relation, he unconscientiously acquires title to the trust property by purchase or gift directly from the beneficiary, or when he uses the trust property for his own benefit or in his own business and by means of such use obtains additional gains and profits, and in these and all similar cases, equity impresses a constructive trust upon the property purchased or obtained and upon the profits acquisition so made for the benefit of the party beneficially entitled. Footnote 1 it says in the footnote the dealings between persons and fiduciary relations have been fully examined in the previous sections concerning constructive fraud. The cases there cited are also authorities for and illustrations of the text. Since the trust above mentioned arises from the wrongful dealings with the trust property, they are described. See cases cited anti under section 957 and 963. A lot of case sites to support that then. Back into the text. This form of constructive trust embraces many particular instances, and the principle is extended to all abuses of confidence, whereby the one in whom the confidence is reposed obtains an advantage. Next section, 1053, number 8, trust ex malefactio. In general, however, the legal title to property, real or personal, 
has been obtained through actual fraud, misrepresentation, or concealments, or through undue influence, duress, taking advantage of one's weakness or necessities, or through any other similar means or under any similar circumstances which render it unconscientious for the holder of the legal title to retain and enjoy the beneficial interest, equity impresses a constructive trust on the property thus acquired in favor of the one who is truly and equitably entitled to the same, although he may never perhaps have had any legal estate therein. And a court of equity has jurisdiction to reach the property either in the hands of the original wrongdoer or in the hands of any subsequent holder until a purchaser of it in good faith and without notice acquires a higher right and takes the property relieved from this trust. The forms and varieties of this trust, which are termed ex malefacio or ex delecto, are particularly without limit. The principle is applied whenever it is necessary for obtaining the justice, the complete justice, although the law may also give the remedy of damages against the wrongdoer. Footnote 1C says, see anti-cases cited under section 946 through 951, which furnishes many examples of these trusts, case sites to follow. Back into the text, while these instances are so many and various, there are certain special forms of frequent occurrences and great importance which requires particular mention. Next section, 1054, number one. A device or bequeath procured by fraud. Whenever a person procures a device or bequeath to be made directly to himself and thereby preventing perhaps an, an intended testamentary gift to another, through false and fraudulent representations, assurances, or promises that he will carry out the original and true purpose of the testator and will apply the device or bequeath to the benefit of a third person who is the real object and who would otherwise have been the actual recipient of the testator's bounty and after the testator's death, he refuses to comply with his former assurances and, or promises, but claims to hold the property and his own right, and for his own exclusive benefit. In such case, equity will enforce the obligation by impressing a trust upon the property in favor of the one who has been fraud, or defrauded of the testator's intended gift, and by treating the actual devisee or legatee as a trustee holding the mere legal title, and by compelling him to carry the trust, into effect through a conveyance to the one who is beneficially interested. It is not necessary that representations, assurances, or promises of the actual divisi or legatee should be in writing. They may be entirely verbal. And there are a few cases which seem to hold that a trust will arise under these circumstances from a mere verbal promise of the divisi or legatee to hold the property for the benefit of another person. That, by definition, is what I just explained to when I said Granted in trust to T for B. It says the same thing. A few cases seem to hold true that the trust will arise under these circumstances for the mere verbal promise of the divisi or legatee to hold the property for the benefit of a third person. That's as simple as a trust gets. Nothing difficult about it. If you really understood that simple little sentence, you could come up with a verbiage to put in any kind of trust you want. Back in the text. This position, however, is clearly opposed to settled principles. The only ground upon which a trust can be rested is rested by the overwhelming weight of authority is actual intentional fraud. Next section, 1055. Number two, purchase upon a fraudulent verbal promise. A second well-settled and even common form of trust, ex malefactio, occurs Whenever a person acquires the legal title to land or other property by means of an intentionally false and fraudulent verbal promise to hold the same for a certain specified purpose, as, for example, a promise to convey the land to a designated individual or to recover it to the grantor and the like, and having thus fraudulently obtained the title, he retains uses and claims the property is absolutely his own so that the whole transaction by means which the ownership is obtained is, in fact, a scheme of actual deceit. Equity regards such a person as holding the property charged with a constructive trust and will comply him to fulfill the trust by conveying according to his engagement. Footnote 1. It says the trust in such a case arise wholly from fraud. The statute of frauds requires a written declaration of trust. does not apply since trust ex malefactio are accepted from its operations. 
accept it from its operations. So you don't have to have a declaration as trust under that condition. Ex malefactio. Case sites to support that. Back into the text. Next section, 1056, number three. No trust from a mere verbal promise. The foregoing cases should be carefully distinguished from those in which there is a mere verbal promise to purchase and convey land. In order that the doctrine of trust ex malefactio will respect to land may be enforced under any circumstances, there must be something more than a mere verbal promise. However, unequivocal, otherwise the statutes of frauds would be virtually abrogated, there must be an element of positive fraud accompanying the promise and by means of which the acquisition of the legal title is wrongfully consummated. Equity does not pretend to enforce verbal promises in the face of the statute in endeavors to prevent and punish fraud by taking from the wrongdoer the fruits of his deceit and it accomplishes this object by its beneficial and far-reaching doctrine of constructive trust. Footnote 1, case sites to support that. Next section, 1057, number four, trust in favor of creditors. In carrying out the general principle of trust for the purpose of working ultimate justice, the reaching property where the legal title has been parted with and it's beyond the scope of legal process, a constructive trust is said to arise in favor of the judgment creditors with respect to the property of their uh, debtors, which has been transferred with the intent to defraud the creditors of their rights or of which the legal title is vested in third persons with a like fraudulent intent, or which it is of a nature that it cannot be taken by execution upon judgments and legal actions. Footnote 1. It says in the footnote, a trust is in reality one in name alone. The creditor's right to reach the debtor's property is in no true sense an interest in that property. It is at most only an equitable lien on the property. Since the creditor's rights to pursue his property to, uh, under the circumstances mentioned is constantly spoken of by judges and text writers as based upon the trust affecting such property. I have simply enumerated the case among the different species of a constructive trust. The examination of the doctrine is postponed until the subject of the creditor's suits and other similar remedies is reached. See the case sites to support. Also see sections antes 972 and 973. Back into the text, next section, 1058, rights and remedies of the beneficiary now. The essential nature of constructive trust has been explained in the former paragraph. Equity regards the say key trust in all instances except that last mentioned in favor of the creditors, although any legal title and perhaps without any written evidence of interest as the real owner and entitled to the rights and consequences of such ownership. Numerous important questions concerning the conduct of trustees, their relation with the trust property and with beneficiaries which arise from expressed trust can have no existence in connection with constructive trust. Even acts of the trustee in holding, managing, and investing or otherwise dealing of the trust property as though he could retain it is itself a violation of his paramount obligation to the beneficiary. If a trustee refuses or delays to convey the property to its beneficial owner and retains it, deriv derives benefit from its use and appropriates its rents, profits, and income, he must account for all that he thus receives and pay over the amount found to be due to the SETI key trust, as well as to convey to him the corpus of the trust fund. The beneficiary, although being the true owner, may always, by means of an equitable suit, compel the trustee to convey or assign the corpus of the trust property and to account for and pay over the rents, profits, issues, and income which he has actually received, or in general, which he might, with the exercise of reasonable care and diligence, have received. In such a suit, the plaintiff is also entitled to any additional or auxiliary remedy, such as an injunction, cancellation, accounting, which may be necessary to render his final relief fully efficient. No change in the form of trust property affected by the trustee will impose, impede the rights of the beneficial owner to reach it, and to compel its transfer, provided it can be intended as a distinct fund and it is not 
so mingled up with other monies or property that it can no longer be specifically separated. If the trust property has been transferred to a bona fide purchase for value without notice or has lost its identity, the beneficial owner must, and under other circumstances, he may resort to the personal liability of the wrongdoing trustee. Footnote 3 says case site to support that. Back in the text, the existence of a constructive trust as a resulting one must be proved by clear, unequivocal evidence. 4G, uh, that says a delay in enforcing the beneficiary's rights. See case sites to support. Brings us to a new section, section six, explaining powers, duties, and liabilities of expressed trustees. Beginning in section 1059, the divisions. The duties and liabilities of the trustees and corresponding rights of the beneficiaries and trust arising by operation of the law have been explained in the preceding section. The discussions of the precedent section refer primarily mainly to the powers, duties, and liabilities of the trustees and express trusts of all kinds and for the purpose and the statement of their duties and liabilities necessarily includes the corrective rights and remedies of the SETI K trust in, and some of the conclusions may, however, apply to trustees and resulting in constructive trusts. The entire subject embraces the following subdivisions. Number one, the trustee's power and modes of acting. Two, his duties and liabilities. And three, his compensation and allowances. And four, removal and appointment of trustees. So first, 1060, powers and modes of acting. Although an acceptance by a trustee is not required in order to assure the interest and rights of the beneficiary, it is essential that the existence of any power or liability of the trustee himself, both his powers and his liability, originate upon his acceptance. Footnote 1, which states C. Ante, Section 1007, case sites of support. Back in his text, the acceptance may be expressed by executing an instrument in writing or implied from acts done by the trustee in carrying the trust into effect or in dealings with the trust property. Footnote 2. Again, case sites that support that. Back in the text, when property is given upon trust to two or more trustees, they become joint owners, and in general, all who have accepted must unite in conveyances and similar solemn and important acts. Footnote 3. It says these assumes, of course, that there are no express provisions to the contrary in the instrument creating the trust. In other words, the law of the trust is the trust instrument itself, the indenture. That is the law of the case. Back in the text, it results from the joint tenancy of trustees that when one dies or resigns, all of the estate and powers remain in the survivors or survivor, and this right of survivorship will not be affected merely because there is a power of appointment, new, new appointing new trustees in place of those dying or ceasing to act. It will operate until the new trustees are appointed. Upon the death of a single trustee or a last survivor, the trust may devolve upon his heir or administrator until a new trustee is appointed. Next section, 1061. Second, duties and liabilities. In this subdivision, I shall state the general duties and express trustees and violations of them which constitute a breach of trust and the nature and extent of the liabilities incurred thereby. The doctrines to examine are those which courts of equity apply in controlling the conduct of all classes of persons with, who are closed with fiduciary relations toward property in which others are beneficially interested, including trustee proper, ex executors and administrators, guardians of infants and or of persons non commodus mentis, directors or managers of corporations and other quasi-trustees. Quasi-trustees, not full trustees, quasi-trustees. All various duties of actual and quasi-trustees may be grouped under these three general heads. Number one, to carry out the trust. Two, to care and diligence. And three, to act with good faith. And each of the, these contains several more specific obligations. Next section, 1061. Number one, to carry the trust into execution. 
number one, the duty to conform strictly to the directions of the trust. That's number one under uh, number I. Under the general obligation of carrying the trust into execution, trustees and all fiduciary persons are bound in the first place to conform strictly to the directness, directions of the trustee. And this, thus is, in this fact, the cornerstone upon which all other duties rest, the source from which all other duties take their origin. The trust itself, whether it be, constitutes the character of the trustee's powers and duties. From it, he derives the rules of his conduct. It prescribes the extent and limits of his authority. It furnishes the measure of his obligations. If the trust is expressed, created by deed or will, then the provisions of the instrument must be followed and obeyed. If the fiduciary relation is established by law and regulated by settled legal rules, then these legal rules must be constantly, uh, cons constantly guide and restrain the conduct of the one who occupies the relation. <clears throat> In this matter, the acts, powers, and duties, and liabilities of the executors, administrators, and guardians, and corporate corporation directors are governed by a fixed system of legal rules which constitute their instrument or declaration of trust. Sounds like a statutory trust. Footnote 1 says, In the case of corporation, directors, and officers, the characters and bylaws are the primary source of a fiduciary power and duty. Even if the trust is purely resulting or constructive one, the simple duty to convey the property and pay over all the profits to the beneficiaries marked out by the law. Again, it comes down to what do you define law as? Well, it could be the intent of the, the uh, legislators. But what do you mean by the intent? What do you mean? Well, it could be the spirit, what the original fathers were. Well, what is the spirit? Which spirit is it? The, the spirit of the... Uh, Christ or the spirit of Antichrist? Is it the spirit of black or is it the spirit of white? Which one is the spirit? What do you mean by spirit? What do you mean by law? What do you mean by intent? We have to define our terms specifically here so we know what we're talking about. Otherwise, we're going to be hung up on the, the intent of the Constitution. What does that mean? So if there are the four through the nonfeasance or he admits to carry the trust in the execution or through malfeasance he disobeys the directions of the trust, he renders himself in some manner liable to the beneficiary whose rights have been thus violated. I missed a sentence. A trustee can use the property only for the purpose contemplated in the trust and must conform to the provisions of the trust in their true spirit, intent, and meaning, and not merely in their letter. What is the true spirit? What is the intent? Like Clinton said, it all comes down to the definition of what is means. But if you can redefine it under a different jurisdiction as a different meaning than it is specified in equity, then you've wordsmithed everything and really you've built a doctrine of lies. Because now you have multiple jurisdictions with multiple meanings, and why is that? Could that be for the purpose of deception? And can your discernment discern what is true? Back in the text, if therefore through nonfeasance he omits to carry the trust into execution or through malfeasance he disobeys, disobeys the direction of the trust, he renders himself in some manner liable to the beneficiary whose rights have been thus violated. But note two, as an illustration, merely in a trust to sell, the trustee must not sell except for a proper object and must protect the interest of all the city trustants in selling by obtaining, as far as may be reasonable, the full value or the best possible price. 
case sites as support. Back into the text. Trustees in carrying the trust into execution are not confined to the very letter of the provision. They have authority to adopt measures that to do acts which, although not specific, specified in the instrument, are implied in its general directions are and are reasonable and proper means of making them effectual. The implied discretion and in the choice of measures and acts is subject to the control of the courts of equity. Control of a court of equity. So if you're not in a court of equity or if you're in a different jurisdiction, then how is it going to control it under the proper method of enforcement based on the principles which truth is? Could it be in a wrong intent being enforced based on a narrow interpretation? Just because you're a Supreme Court judge doesn't make it right what you say. What is it you base your judgment upon? Your own opinion? Why do they call the opinions coming out of the courts opinions? No, I think I want a decree based on equitable principles, which is the God conscious mind principles, really. He who comes into equity must be doing equity. That's the same thing as loving your brothers yourself, or the same thing as Matthew 7 12. The golden rule. No, we're worshiping the golden calf, along with the God of Moloch and Ishtar. Got a fornication. The God of golden calf, commerce. The God of Moloch, abortion. Back into the text. It falls from the general duty that trustees cannot set up the adverse title of a stranger against their seti key trusting and much less buy up and hold s such adverse title for their own benefit. Next section, 1063, number two, the duty to account. As a branch of the general obligation of carrying the trust into execution, a trustee is also bound to account for all the trust property. He must not only render a full account of his conduct at the time of final settlement, but it is one of his utmost imperative duties to keep regular and accurate accounts during the whole course of the trust of all property coming into, passing out of, or remaining in his hands. And these accounts must clearly distinguish between the trust property and his own individual assets, for the two should never be mingled into accounts nor in use. They should show all receipts and payments and should at all times be to the inspection and produced at demand of the beneficiary. Footnote 1. It says, footnote, a failure to keep full and accurate accounts arises, raises all presumptions against the trustee, and it may subject him to pecuniary loss by rendering him liable to pay interest or chargeable with monies received and not duly accounted for. back into the text. Next section, 1064, number three, the duty to obey directions by the court. Whenever there is a bona fide doubt as to the true meaning and intent of the provisions of the instrument creating the trust, as to the particular course which he ought to pursue, the trustee is always entitled to maintain a suit in equity at the expense of the trust estate and obtain a judicial construction of the instrument and the directions as to his own conduct. In such directions he must, of course, faithfully obey, and if he does so, he will be relieved from all responsibility. Therefore, whenever any suit or proceeding is instituted by the beneficiary or other persons interested, and the court, by its decree or order, therein directs anything to be done or admitted by the trustee, such directions are imperative and must be implicitly obeyed. A refusal or neglect to obey any render uh, may render the trustee liable to a summary punishment for as a contempt by fine and imprisonment. Footnote 1 says several of these cases are examples of such applications or when applications are or are not necessary. 
give some case sites to support that. One, Henry Shaw's Trust, LR, 12 Equity, 125, 20, excuse me, 124. A few others. Next section, 1065, number four, the duty to restore the trust property at the end of the trust. And finally, when the trust is ended and the authority of the trustee as such ceases, it is his duty to restore the property to the persons who are then entitled to it, either by terms of the instrument or by operations of legal rules. To accomplish this object, he is bound to make such conveyances as the, the parties may require in order to vest the title in them. Footnote one says the trustee may under some circumstance demand, demand a release from the trust from those who to whom he transfers the estate. Case sites to support. Back into the text. Number two, section under 1066 to use care and diligence now. The second branch of the trustee's obligation is to use care and diligence in the discharge of his functions. This duty is very comprehensive. It extends through the entire range of his conduct and is entirely independent of the question of good faith, for he will by be liable for his failure even though no wrongful intent or violation of good faith is charged upon him. It may He may be liable for its neglect or being held answerable to for property actually lost through want of care or prudence, and also for monies which he might have received if he had exercised due care, prudence, and judgment in his investments and other dealings with the trust estate. His head embraces the protection of trust property, the delegation of authority to third persons, and to co-trustees, and among of care and the amount of care and diligent requisite, and the important subject of making investments which will be considered in the order here indicated. 1067, number one, the duty of protecting trust property. The trustee is bound to protect trust property in every reasonable manner during the countenance of the trust. He must therefore be due diligence obtain the possession of the trust property and must then retain it securely under his own control. He cannot divest himself of the trust by conveying it or signing the property away to third persons unless the trust itself is for the very purpose of sale or other disposition, and even then he can only dispose of the property in pursuance of the trust and to carry out its objects. Footnote 2. It says under that footnote, the trustee is, of course, liable for any loss occasioned by his undue neglect to obtain possession of the property or to retain it securely. Case sites to support. Back into the text, as a mode of obtaining secure possession, the trustee must with all reasonable diligence collect debts and demands and the amounts due on chooses and actions and require to do so by terms of the trust instrument or by the nature and objects of the trust, and he is liable for losses resulting from his negligence or unreasonable delay in this matter. Footnote 3. Does the trustee duties and liabilities concerning investments and his permitting funds to remain invested in certain kinds of securities are stated in subsequent paragraphs. See sections 1071 through 1074. The nature of the trust will generally determine whether notes, stocks, and other things in action should be conveyed or converted into money and if the trust instrument in terms gives to the beneficiary the income arising from the certain specified choices in action and the form of the investment would thus be declared and no duty would generally arise to convert such securities into money. See the case sites that support that. Back into the text. Trust monies may be deposited for any reasonable time in a bank account having good credit, and if the deposit is made to the credit of the trust estate and not to the trustee's individual name and account, and the trustee does not become liable for loss occasioned by the failure of the bank under these circumstances. He is liable, however, for the loss resulting from a failure of the bank or of a broker when funds which ought to have been invested are left remaining on deposit and when the deposit is in trustee's individual account mingled with his other funds. 
or wrongful payment made to third persons or to a set of key trust, the trustee is generally chargeable. Footnote 6, which states, in each case must, with a great extent, stand upon its own circumstances, where a payment made in good faith with the exercise of reasonable care and prudence turns out to be wrong, the trustee may not be obligated to take the amount good for the benefit of the estate. Back into the text. Next section, 1068. Number two, the duty not to delegate his authority. The office of trustee is one of personal confidence and cannot be delegated. A trustee, therefore, unless expressly authorized by the instrument of trust, cannot delegate or transfer or entrust in whole or in part his powers of discretion and management to associate, subordinate, or assistant who takes his place and assumes his responsibility. If he does so, he remains liable to the beneficiary and is chargeable for all acts and omissions of his delegate in which, with all losses, whether occasioned by the latter's fraud, neglect, want of good faith, or other causes. This rule does not prohibit the trustee from employing agents. He may act through agents in his administrative operations whenever such a mode of dealing is in accordance with the ordinary course of business. Footnote 2, which states, for example, he may employ a steward or a manager of the state for all matters strictly ministerial. He can, of course, employ clerks, bookkeepers, and the like, and he can deposit trust monies in a reasonable bank and direct clerks who collects sums to deposit them there, and he can remit monies by bills drawn on or by responsible parties, etc. If he acts in such manner according to the customary modes of doing business, in good faith and with reasonable prudence, he will not be re- responsible for the loss of trust funds occurring through such dealings. Case sites to support that. So all comes under the administration of the trust per the trustees. Otherwise, you're going to end up breaching trust. You've got a trust, learn how to administer it, or at least know what the person administering the trust is supposed to be doing. If you're the beneficiary, you've got to know what's going on. Otherwise, the wool's going to be pulled over your eyes. You're going to be fleeced. Back into the text, next section, 1069. Number three, duty not to surrender entire control to co-trustee. As a trustee cannot delegate his authority to a subordinate, on, so on the same principle, he cannot idly yield to or surrender the entire control of the trust property and exercise of trust functions to his co-trustees when he is an associate in the trust with others. A trustee is not liable under all circumstances for every act or default of his co-trustees, but still, in general, where there are several trustees, the beneficiary is entitled to that security and protection which results from the care oversight, and cooperation of all trustees. If, therefore, a trustee virtually abandons his actual active function, neglects to interpose in the management, and leaves the whole control of his co-trust, to his co- trustees, uh, leaves whole control to his co-trustees, he will be liable for losses occasioned by their wrongful acts or neglects. Footnote 1, case sites to support that. Next section, 1070, number 4 the amount of care and diligence required. The principle is well settled that trustees are bound to exercise care and prudence in the execution of their trust in the same degree that men of common prudence ordinarily exercise in their own affairs. A trustee, in other words, must use the same care, skill, diligence, and prudence in his management of the trust and his dealings with the trust property, which a man of ordinary care, skill, and prudence would use in his own transactions and with his own property under such like circumstances, and the trustee is answerable for all losses, deficiencies, and injuries which are occasioned by his affirmative or negative violation of this obligation. Footnote 1 states that this doctrine is so fully and ably examined in the very recent case of Hun versus Carey. said that I shall require a quote from it at some length. The action was brought to receive by uh, representing the depositors against a portion of the directors of a savings bank. The bank was located in New York City and did a very small business. Up until January 1873, the, its average deposits were about $70,000, and its income had been less than its expenses. And in May of 1887, or 1873, 
the bank, by order of the board of directors, bought a lot of $29,000, paying $10,000 for the price in each cash, uh, of this price in cash. It then erected a building on this lot, costing $27,000, and gave a mortgage thereon for $30,500. All of this was done with the avowed object of increasing the apparent credit of the bank and thereby its business. Two years after the bank failed, this lot and building and other property amounting only to $1,000 constituted the entire assets of the bank. In other words, all the assets except $1,000 were swallowed up. And in the lots in the building, and this was all swept away by foreclosure of the mortgage. Before the purchase of the lot, the bank had occupied leased rooms and its total assets were several thousand dollars less than its debts, which fact was known to the directors when they made the purchase. The charter gave the directors power to purchase a lot for the bank housing and held that the transaction was not a mere error of judgment and that the directors were personally liable. In regard to the position of directors, the court held that the, that the relation of the directors to the bank was that of agent to principal. The relation of the directors to the depositors was that of trustee and set a key trust. On the general doctrine Concerning the duties of trustee, the court said, per Earl J., page 70, quote, if the trustees act fraudulently or do a willfully wrong, it is no doubt that they will be held for all damages they cause to the bank or its depositors. If they act in good faith with the limits of powers conferred, using proper uh, uh, prudence and diligence, they are not responsible for mere mistakes or errors of judgment. What degree of care and diligence are they bound to exercise? Not the highest degree, not such as a very vigilant or extremely careful person would exercise. When one deposits money in the savings bank and takes stock of a corporation, he expects that it has the right to expect that the trustees or directors will exercise ordinary care and prudence and the trust committed to them, the same degree of care and prudence that men prompted by self-interest generally exercise in their own affairs. It is impossible to give the measure of culpable negligence for all cases as the degree of care required depends upon the subject which it is to be applied. Then there's another case, First National Bank versus Ocean National Bank. Quite long. I don't really want to go into it. Ah, read this rest of it yourself. Back in the text. The law does not cast upon the trustee an extraordinary duty, nor demand for extraordinary care, nor hold him liable for a mere error of judgment, much less does he it make him an insurer of the property. If he has exercised the, exercised the care and judgment of ordinary prudent men in their affairs, he will not be chargeable for his mere errors of judgment, nor for accidental injuries and losses. This rule concerning the extent and limits of the trustee's duty to use care, diligence, and prudence applies to all his transactions and connections with the trust and all his dealings with the trust property by which the interest and beneficiary can be affected. If some of the particular rules concerning the making and retaining of investments seem to be more stringent, they will be found upon closer examination to the application of the same general doctrine varied only by nature and situation of the subject matter. The results from the duty that the trustee may be held accountable for more property than which actually came into his possession, and he may be charged with, he may be charged with rents, profits, and interest, income, proceeds of sales and the like, which he never in fact received, but which he might and should have received by the exercise of due diligence and reasonable care, diligence and prudence in his modes of dealing. Footnote 2, case I to support that. Back into the text, the trustee who pays the wrong party will generally be liable to pay over again to those who are really entitled. Footnote 3.
process where a trustee acting in good faith and even deceived by forged documents pays trust funds in the wrong party and is held that he must pay over again the amount with interest to those who are entitled. Case sites to support that. Another case where, by mistake, he pays capital to life tenants instead of investing it and paying the income, he must make it good but be entitled to recoup out of the life interest in fix, fixing the amount of its deficiency. Case sites to support that. Back into the text. Next section, 1071, number five, the duty as to investments. The general obligation under consideration finds that it's most striking and important application in the matter of the investment of trust funds. It is the trustee's duty to use diligence in investing the trust property so that it may produce as much income as possible and also be used care and prudence in investing it in such securities as will render it its loss highly improbable, even if not virtually impossible. From these somewhat antagonistic duties arise two corresponding liabilities. If a trustee suffers money to lie idle in his hands, producing no income, when by proper investment an income might have been obtained, and this continues for an unreasonably long time, he will be liable for the amount of income which he might not to have made by an investment, and will be charged with such amount by the court in the settlement of his accounts. On the other hand, if he made an investment in improper securities, contrary to the settled rules of equity on the subject, and the principal has been wholly or partially lost through insolvency or depreciation of value, or has failed to produce income, he will be held personally responsible for the loss or deficiency. If, however, an investment is made with the exercise of reasonable care, diligence, and business prudence in the form, manner, and securities approved of by the rules of equity, a trustee will not be liable for losses which may occur through the destruction or depreciation of values. The general duty involves two separate elements which will be separately examined. The necessity of making investments and the proper kind of securities in which the investments may be made. Next section, 1072, the necessity of making investments. I think we'll leave off there and we'll pick up there next time on section 1072. That's page 364 in the book, and a PDF, excuse me, and page 2457 in the book. Section 1072, we'll pick up there next time. So let's open it up for Q&A. Anybody have a question and raise your hand, press star 8. Press star 8 to get in the queue line and ask a question. Star 8 to raise your hand. State your name, where you're from. Star eight, anybody? Question? Star eight to raise your hand. Star eight, anybody? Question? Star eight. Anybody on the board? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Who's this? Hey, how you doing, Christian? Chris. Christian. Hi, Chris. How's it going? Good. How's the weather up there? Oh, it was warm today. I mean, we had a lot of snow uh, last Thursday, but uh, it's like 56 today, so. Oh, good. A lot of snow melted. But that that was a nice break from the cold winter we've been having. What's on your mind? Uh, well, uh, you know, I kind of talked a couple of weeks, you know, last week about a hypothetical case. And um, so I did some more digging hypothetically and went to the court building to, to get copies of the deeds of trust and and found out they had some other information up there as far as a certificate of satisfaction, uh, of satisfaction regarding uh, the supposed loan that's supposed to be there. 
But in the meantime, hypothetically, a servicer has filed a, a foreclosure a foreclosure case. Okay. This one, this one. If you had any thoughts about that, so somehow they, you know, it's it's been satisfied or it had the certificate saying everything's been satisfied, yet and still they came with a um, hypothetically a foreclosure case. Oh, you're saying that there is a a, a loan satisfaction? Yep. Document already filed there? Yep. And does the nexus, uh, is it the same subject matter? Yes. Okay, that's very interesting, yeah. Uh, well, uh, a certified copy of that loan satisfaction would then certainly shed a question on the foreclosure's intent. Certified copy, okay. Yeah, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking they were doing so many so much stuff at the time that there's just a mistake they made because uh, at the hypothetical at the time of the refinance it was in the September of one year, and then they never recorded anything until the next year in June. Okay, well, how how did you go about finding it? And where did you look to find that? Uh, just went up to the courthouse, to the courthouse, the land records, and. Uh, actually, he was going up to for another house to get uh, some deed of trust information and then ask for that same information for uh, the hypothetical alleged uh, house where the foreclosure action has been filed. So the same place where the foreclosure action has been filed, there is on record a lien satisfaction. Yes, sir. And then the <laughs> same instrument numbers match up with the release, uh, of, and the release of mortgage. Same instrument numbers. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Very simple to go up and check. Uh, I, I suggested everybody would go up and check and see whether or not there was a lien satisfaction up there. And if there right. is, well, then that's positive proof that there is no lien. And why are they foreclosing? Right. All right. Obviously, if that's true, then there's somebody that didn't do due diligence. And they filed an action without checking, and, and then they've obviously breached the party and uh, caused a prejudice. And if you wanted to take and go after legal damages, you could possibly do that and get them for compensatory, punitive, and all that other stuff, you know, because of psychological grievances and things. And they actually come up with, uh, you know, ten, twenty, thirty million dollar lawsuit on the legal side to. Uh, hit them with because they've damaged you and prejudiced you. Damaged you, okay. All right, well, I'm going to verify those uh, instrument numbers and also you should get a, a certified copy of that. Yeah, of this. Keep in mind if you ask for damages, you're not in the equity side. Right, this is still in the at-law side, right? You're in the at-law jurisdiction to do that. Right. right, but if I'm on the at-law side and I'm going for, for that, as long as I don't go, go for the fraud, I can still go back on the equity side, correct? For fraud, yes. Okay. As long as I don't sue for the fraud on the at law side, and I still have fraud on the equity private side if I want to pursue that. Yeah, because fraud under equity is different from fraud at law. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to, I guess, do some verification and but uh, that's exactly what's up there, a certificate of satisfaction. And it had the, the, the uh, hypothetical yeah. bank's name on it and everything. So This was a foreclosure case, and you were in a current case with that. You could get that dismissed with that evidence. Okay. Okay. See, it was funny. Back at the time, a little bit back at the time when the original uh, alleged refinance happened, I did receive a letter from the bank some time after that saying that it had been satisfied, but I didn't. I just thought it was for, you know, the other house. I thought they made a mistake. So, but evidently they did make a mistake, so. Um. All right. Well, I'm uh, kind of riding high here. I just want to definitely validate everything and, uh, and I'll give you up, keep you uh, keep you posted. Yep, N-O-I-S-O-I. 
in the last uh, most interesting of interest. All right, thanks. Okay, Chris, thanks for coming on. All right, I'll let somebody get on. Who else can on? Thanks. All right. Who's next? Star eight for anybody questions? Star eight. If you want to ask a question, press star eight to raise your hand and get in the queue line. Hey C W, this is Tyrone. Can you hear me? Hi, Tyrone. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, great, great, great. You were reading um some information about trust today. I wanna to kinda of touch back touch um touch on that see so I can kind of untwist my thinking on it. Okay. All right. Um uh, you read in the section about defending the trust and the beneficiary has the right to defend the trust. Mm-hmm. And then also um interested trust party. The, okay, the interested party. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Um, you also talk about no party needs to know a trust has been formed. Many trusts are formed without an indenture, correct? Well, right. So if that's the case, how would you administer the trust? Well, you'd have to know that you were forming a trust to, uh, you know, enforce the trust and you'd have to know that you wanted your property back or some duty, whatever it was, you know, because I could give a party a pen and say that I want my pen back sometime in the future. You know, you got the use of my pen, but that was a If the guy doesn't give me my pen back, now I got the chance to go into ad law and sue the guy from the pen for the pen because or I got the choice to go into equity and 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 do an equitable suit to get the performance to return the pen back. Yeah, okay. I, I have to know that this trust was a trust in existence and that it was solely enforceable in equity. Otherwise, I'm going to walk into the at-law jurisdiction all the time. Okay, with that. That's a problem. Mm-hmm. But that, again, ties in with Hosea 4.6. It says we're all perishing for a lack of knowledge, understanding. So did I explain it, or you, you, you explain it? But okay, did I answer your question? Let's put it that way. Or is there something else that leaves? No. Yeah, it, I need to flush it out a little bit more. And, and the reason I'm, I'm saying is, okay, uh, hypothetically, we wake up and we understand now. Okay, all of these trusts are out here. So now I want to start correcting some of them, start to administer some of them. And I didn't write an indenture. So should I notice the parties first or should I send an indenture first? How do I administer the trust before you go to, you know, before? First you need to create some manifestation of intention that you intended to form a trust. Even though the trust was already formed, you got to sometime – create some documents because it's a manifestation of intention that controls. Otherwise, okay. everybody's got, you know, DC contracts that they sign, which is only one half of the trust and the other part that's non expressed because it's oral and they don't understand what it's all about being two trusts, say, and they're not creating any documents to come in with anything counter. So the documents is important because it's the records that proves the intent. So could could that document initiation be a notice? That well, would have to be yes, because you'd have to notice the parties, and that's what NTT is all about: how to create the trust, or how to create records for the trust existence, and and how to notice the parties in order to enforce it. Hmm. That's very uh, 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 that, that that helps me, okay? Because I understand the notice part. What what was fuzzy to me was that all of these trusts are here, but 
they are not necessarily having a venture attached to them. So the trustee is administering the trust the best yeah, way he like knows how. The pen to somebody, that trustee that I gave the pen to, had the duty to return the pen sometime in the future after he was done using it. There was no indenture there. It was okay. more of trust. Okay. So, all right, let's, let's stay on that line of thinking. Say he took that pen and and um, multiplied it up or derived it up, and it's ten more pins associated with that pin. Uh-huh. Okay, so now I've given notice that I want my my pin back. Well, also, those ten other pins are considered mine also. Is that not correct, or am I way off in left field? No, if that was... Uh resulted from the trust res originally, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, the, all the thing that results from the trust res is entitled to the beneficiary as a product from it, a proceed from it. And he's entitled to it all. Even if the indenture is not wrote up, if I give no verbal indenture, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you see, most people only have the records created under the D.C. side, and they have no records created on the equitable trust side. And it's the manifestation of the records that controls. That's why it's important to know how to form the records for the expression of the trust or the correction of a misconstruement of the trust. What's, what's interesting with all of this, uh, CW, is that I've noticed now how every legal fiction, if they're about to do something, notices you. Every time. They don't do anything without a notice. Right. That's the first step on page uh, Gibson's book, section 71, notice. Through seventy or sixty five through seventy one. Section sixty five notice starting there. And and a notice is initiating the records. If they don't answer the notice, it's like they answered the notice. So yeah, the then you can is giving you notice that there's something going on and if you don't do anything about it, well, then you're waving and willfully blind. Hmm. Question? This is um this is good, CW. This is um this really helping me. So all the all the proceeds from the pins are attached to the first pin and all of that could be initiated with the notice. Yeah, because everything it was had to do with the original res any proceeds from that, that belongs to the beneficiary, the SETI key trust. Hmm. Okay. I got it now. I, I appreciate it, CW. This is um, the sex you read tonight really, really helped me out. I'm, I'm, uh, I've never administered a trust before, so all of this is new, and so many different types of trust. But I but really, the uh, very one you just have to uh, be concerned with so much as the uh, just the express trust, because the constructive trust of resulting trust, you know, that's more on the uh, by operation of law. Mm-hmm.
with this express trust, um, can the can the trustee not do the duty once you notice them? Well, sure he can. Yeah, he he could uh, try to repudiate. Have you read uh, 1-202 in UCC? Mm-hmm. That's the notice or acknowledgement section. Uh, it gives a pretty good codified version of equitable notice. And, and, that, and that's what confused me also because the UCC is not trust law. Correct. Although it, there is an equitable character in the law. But that doesn't mean it has an equitable nature. But the character and the nature got to line up. You can't have an equitable nature with an equitable character. Otherwise, the character is an imposter look alike, and it's not the true nature. It's like a good tree with a good nature root producing a bad character fruit. That's impossible. So the nature and character got to line up. Legal nature, legal character. Equitable nature, equitable character. If you've got a, uh, a legal nature and an equitable character, you got something that doesn't line up. you got a good root producing bad fruit, say character being the fruit, nature being the root. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Bad tree can't produce good fruit. So the nature and character must line up or else something is screwy. The spirit being the nature must line up with the character. So you got a codification of equitable notice, Section 65 in Gibson's, which a conversion has been done, a codification, turning it into a privilege under UCC 1-202, which is a right that's revocable. Where under equity, there is no revocation of the right. You always have the right, and the right can't be taken away from you. So why did we convert it? for the limitations based on a commercial nature. But the commercial nature doesn't line up with the equitable nature. Nor does the character. Why? That's conflict. Because the principles in which they're too based are opposite like mixing oil and water. They don't mix. Anything else? No, that, that was it. That was it. I, I um, just had a question been... And um, when you when you was reading that, that kind of sparked that you know operating the trust without the invention. So hmm. the nature okay. of character thing when we mentioned that about two years ago and came up with that, I knew a lot of people just don't get that. They don't understand that. Mm -hmm. That's like splitting a fine hair, you know, again and. People just can't comprehend splitting the hair that's almost invisible in half again, you know. Right. That 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 um, confuses me at times too. Yeah, you've got the equitable nine tenths of the law, which is equity, split to a one tenth enforcement, the statutes and codes, or the common law, or the Ten Commandments, 
And that one-tenth is the judgment. And that's the character. Now, if that character has no equitable reflection in nature in it, then there's a separation in it. That one-tenth statute and code or common law is not part of the whole law. And the whole law equals the nine-tenths plus the one-tenth. That's what's not being taught today. What is the law? What does the law consist of? Today, we think that the law is the one-tenth and the one-tenth only, to the exclusion of the nine-tenths equity, the principle, which is the unwritten part. No, we go to the codification, which is the writing, which is the one-tenth, but that one-tenth is really only judgment. Judgment of what? Judgment upon not living the nine-tenths part of life, the equity in life. When you put yourself in the one-tenth, you're under the law, the judgment side, and you die because you're not living in the principle, which is the nine-tenths, because if you were running in the principle, you would have life. And grace stems from equity because equity is God's will. By grace we live, or by equity we live, in other words, and by law we die. Because why? Because law is judgment. That's, 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 that's almost like the Old Testament, and they were living under the law, and now the New Testament, once Christ came, we lived under grace. Uh, but we've been living in grace all along. We just put ourselves under judgment. Amen. Why did we put ourselves under judgment? Because we didn't lead equitable lives. And what's it mean to lead equitable lives? Doing the commandments of God. And what are the commandments of God? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, which means the same as love your neighbor as yourself. That is the summation of the law and the prophets. Period. You take the whole Bible, put it down into two sentences. It's like it's not rocket science. And the New Testament and the Old Testament are one and the same. I am the beginning and the last. I am the everlasting. I never end. I am here, O Israel, here. The Lord thy God is one. There is nothing new that God hasn't been saying. It's been our interpretation of it. That's what's been wrong. Jesus came in Matthew 15 and said, You guys, there's a conflict between the commandments of God versus the traditions of men, and you're teaching the laws wrong. Your blind people are being led by blind guides because of the wrong interpretation of the laws. Nothing has changed. It's been that way since Adam's day. And we have the God of golden calf that we worship, which is commerce, money changers. We have the God of Moloch, abortions. And we have the God of Ishtar, fornication and sexual incest and all. The destruction of the marriage covenant. Those are the idols and the Asherah poles and the false altars that we are worshiping today, even when we speak out of the other side of our mouth saying we love God. The records prove the manifestation of your intention by what you do. The actions that you're conducting, the deeds that you do, the records that you create, That's the proof. Even though you say you love God, your actions speak otherwise. It's the crier in the wilderness. Hear ye, hear ye, the 
God's court is now in session for repent for the Lord's kingdom and its enforcement is near. The key word is repent. How does one repent? The only one sermon that I've ever given, I forget what the date of it is, Worshipping False Gods is the title of it. Under the Deuteronomy curse, the mind of confusion, by not choosing the right God to follow, worship this day. True repentance means you've got to agree with God that there's something wrong and what he says is right. That's being humble. Otherwise, you're proud. God will take you down if you're proud, not in his agreement. And when we are humble, agreeing with God, you got to ask God. Take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Give you an understanding. Just like the prayer of Solomon when he prayed for wisdom and knowledge and understanding to lead God's people. Discernment. And what did God do? He not only gave him that, but he gave him much more. He gave him all the money that he could use to build that with. So by not asking for money, but asking for wisdom to lead the people with, God made him the richest man in the world. But you got to be in agreement with God. you got to ask God to change your mind because you're like dead. You can't change anything. I can't change anything. You've got to ask God to empower you and have Christ working through you to change anything. He's got to resurrect you. He's got to open your hearing, open your understanding, but he isn't going to do that until you ask. How many people are asking? No, the churches today are asking God to fix the problem. No, you repent. Ask him to give you the path uh, to operate under the power and authority so that you step out in faith and do the action and the correction based on the principles of God, and then God works through you. We just want to sit in church and pray to God and say, Lord, change the problem. No, he ain't going to do it because he's way ahead of you. You ain't following him. you got to step out in faith or else you got dead faith. We got the church today has the power to correct the problem, all the problems of the world, but none of us are stepping out in faith. We're not stepping out in action. That's true repentance. Keep on asking, seeking, and knocking. We don't do the first one. We don't ask. Any questions? No, that was it, CW. I appreciate you. You be blessed. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, then, Tyrone. Hello, Christian. It's Shaka from England. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm yeah. blessed. <laughs> yeah, it sounds well. Um, yeah, I've got a few different things I'd like to ask you tonight. Um, I've been looking at some of the... Uh, there's, You know, some of the documents I mentioned last week when I was saying there's some information on the Chancery Courts that you can just get online. Yes, I remember. Yeah, I was going through some of that stuff. There's a document called uh, Guidance for Litigants in Person. And uh, it's got a lot of uh, pretty useful information in there on how to go about making an application, how to conduct yourself, and so on and so forth. Um, But I'm just wondering, you know, like information like that, would it be? Uh, I mean, is there some some 
extra things I might have to do to keep it private. Like I've heard you in the past mention things like keeping a, a blank cover sheet, keeping a cover sheet blank and stuff like that, you know? Yes, right. Um, I well, can't means, really answer that because I really don't understand or know the the English laws pertaining to where you were coming from there specifically because the way I understand it, that there is a, a separate jurisdiction and a separate chance record still in existence today where you're at. Yeah. Now, I would think that to keep it, I would still want to keep it private in that separate court jurisdiction of chancery. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to make it public, so I would think that that would have to be so, yes. Okay. But I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it lines up pretty well with the stuff you've gone over that I've heard anyway. Um, I think you are you have an easier task over there, you know, like Great Britain, Australia, and the United Kingdom, because they're chancery courts in existence and they're not merged like they are here and they're, they're, they're still separate and they have their own, like you said, you can go online and get all this information and it's there you know, where here it's kind of hard to pick it out they treat it as it's being merged and no longer two separate jurisdictions but it still is and it seems to be harder yeah yeah, sure Okay. Um, <clears throat> something else I was wondering, um, you know, like this issue of giving notice whenever we do something. I mean, um, I understand that, but re reading through this document, there are it seems like there are cases where you can proceed without giving notice. You can make an application without giving notice to the other party um, under certain exceptional circumstances. Like, I'm wondering what kind of ex circumstances those could be. Um, well, I would say if you already established a trust in the past and the trustee is not doing his duty as trustee, therefore I don't have to give a notice because he's been noticed in the past. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking that. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh some of the other things I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of the uh, Foreign Citus Trust and the CETUK Trust, um, in terms of how it's operating out there, I mean, what we're saying is there's a, there's a trust in operation, but it just hasn't been expressed. Yes, there are many trusts in operations that haven't been expressed, because everything that you do is done in trust, because there's really no money that's required for the yeah. uh, trust transaction no compensation no I mean no consideration mm -hmm. I mean uh, and and the fact that we don't have consideration to complete a contract therefore there are no contracts so then what do we have they have to be trust yeah so we've got all these sub trust like everything that we've done basically like you're saying it uh, yeah. sub trust going to the grocery store and buying you know your groceries well you're not buying your groceries you're 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 entrusted with your groceries Mm -hmm. Same way with you buying your gasoline, your petrol, or whatever. You know, everything that you think you're buying, you're not buying at all. It's all an entrustment. Yeah. All trust transactions. Okay, so what I'm trying to clarify now is the um, the relation between the Foreign Citus Trust and the CETUK Trust. Or, um, you know, because in the past I was thinking that the Foreign Citus Trust was private, and then there's this uh, public... Uh, kind of version of it which came in with the national insurance or what you guys call social security account right. at the age at the age of 15 or 16 um, is, is that the way you're looking at it um, that the foreign citus trust uh, is private? that's how you define it because the foreign citus trust could be say the birth certificate and the birth certificate resides on the public side exactly and then the Social Security thing, or whatever you call it over there, is a spillover of the foreign situs into the other one. Okay. And that's on the public also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now there is a live birth certificate, which is different from the birth certificate. That would be on the private side. Now, I don't know what you want to call that, but you would have to call it something different than those. 
Okay. I, would, I would say private. That's the private trust. Yeah. I'm not sure about that one um, in the UK. That live certificate of live birth or whatever I, I hear Americans talking about. I'm not sure if they have that here. I mean, they must do, but. Yeah, does your mother make application for a birth certificate? Well, over here, what normally happens is um, once the child is born, like, they give you, I think, six weeks to go and do the application for, to do the registry, the entry in the birth register, which is normally the dad who does it. It's normally the father who does it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, you go and, I mean, I've done it a couple of times with my children. You go and you make the entry in the birth register, you sign it, and then they, the certificates they give you are just copies of that entry. It's a certified copy of an entry in the register. Right. So, so um... Sounds like you're doing it just solely on the public side. Yeah, yeah. But then you have the power and authority to create some private documents, like registering it in the Bible and having two witnesses sign it. Okay. Okay, and then you would use something like that as your special deposit. Well... The, the two of them are tied together. One's on a private side and one's on the public side. Uh, it, it just depends how you're uh, going to express them and mm-hmm. you don't want to commingle it. So, But you still want to create the documents. Yeah. Because it's the records that's going to prove the manifestation of your intent. Yeah. Okay. Um. But you know, the birth certificate is called the birth certificate, and that by itself alone is just what it says it is, a record of a birth, a certified birth certificate, certified birth. But then how is it being used? How do they treat it? Because that's what counts. And if it is a record of a human resource, that represents a person's all their life, in other words, the time in their life, that is pledged, and they're using that record or that pledge of time, that person's life, to create money in the system that they put into circulation for the benefit of all the users called currency in circulation, or fiat currency, and fiat means signature, so it's currency put into place by your signature, your pledge that all people are using to their benefit. And that's based on an actuary table of X amount of dollars that are needed in that person's lifetime to exist in all their transactions that they're going to do commercially. And that figure keeps going up. And they put that on a ledger sheet, both on the plus side and the minus side, say, $5 $5 billion on one side, plus side, and minus $5 billion on the other side. And as long as the two registry entries, when you add them together, they come to zero, you've got a fiction. That's nothing, zero. And then we use the minus side, the debt side of that asset ledger, as what we're going to create money with. And we're using the minus side of the ledger, and that's it without the corresponding side of the plus equitable asset. But the whole thing is represented by you, your life, your time, your whole life that you're going to say on an average you're worth so much. But that yeah. all is just a limitation because now it's got a set number on it based on dollars or pounds or whatever and who controls the value of the pound or the dollar. And are you truly free? Mm. And all this is based on economics of supply and demand. And if we have too much of this $5 billion worth of money in circulation, we will dry it up by issuing bonds and putting it into, say, treasury securities and lock it up from circulation. That way it creates a demand for the money, and that sends the value up or what money is supposed to be worth. 
But what is a zero value money worth? Zero. <laughs> so, in in that scenario you just described, like if we look at that as a trust, which is uh, like waiting for me to ex to express. Like it's currently it's currently working as the public is the beneficiary from all this currency circulation based off of my signature. Yeah, human resource. Human resource. Um and the trustee is the government officials and whatnot. On one side of the, the uh, trust, yeah, it's, and then the other side, it's, it's the opposite. You're a trustee yeah. on one side, and you're their beneficiary uh, on that side, and you're a trustee on the other side, or their be you're a beneficiary on the other side, and they're trustee. It's opposite. Yeah. That's that's the two uh, uh, executory trusts. Yeah, I was trying to get my head around this executory trust thing. I haven't looked into it yet. Um so right now, it doesn't if really you are, you're granting your time as a human resource to create the, this beneficial fiction account money, fiat currency, that somebody else is using, but yet that fits the definition of a trust. Mm -hmm. But maybe the parties aren't right. Yeah. Maybe there's a misconstruement. They think they're beneficiaries, but maybe they're they're really trustees. Yeah. But you know, if you were the human resource and you granted your time, your life, and they made money uh, out of that, and then they, for the benefit of third parties, there's your definition of a trust. Granted to T in trust for B. Yeah. So if the, trust, if the beneficiaries are the general public in this general trust, this public trust, then they have the use of all the the funds that you created on your life. Mm -hmm. And then everybody that is a human resource also has this grantor benefiting to everybody else. So here's this massive pool of funds created for the benefit of all. And they're all sharing in the benefit of it. But yet they're not in control of it because they don't know that it is a trust. Uh, they don't know how to enforce it or administer it. And, you know, the, the thing about the whole system is that a system has been a, a implemented that can create money of an infinite amount to get you through any emergency. Yeah. That's the good part about it. Mm -hmm. But except we're not retiring the debt. We're not balancing the books and bringing it to zero. And we keep on mounting up the debt, and we keep on using the debt size, and that's what's, what's uh, that's what the problem is. Yeah. And we continue to have to use new money to refund the old money that's uh, gone its revolutions, and it becomes old money, has to be retired, and new money has to take its place. Mm. So in a, um, you see what it is, I'm, I'm trying to like uh, look at all these things um, with equity eyes and see the trust relationships and what is generally going on and what has happened in the past also. So like with... Uh, Like gold, for instance, like with the HJR 192 or over here, they had an equivalent bill 227, I believe it was in 1931. Oh, did they? Yeah. Oh, which was, it was an amendment to the Gold Standards Act where they basically, um, well, in their own words, suspended the right to purchase gold bullion. 
And uh, I think that's where they made the disconnect between gold and um, the currency. So, Yeah, they switched the, the system from a limited amount of gold out of the ground because it was difficult to get. And they switched it to something that they could create and control that they could make to unlimited because they turned it into a fiction. Mm -hmm. They just picked some arbitrary amount, $5 billion, and stuck it in a ledger sheet on both sides. It could have been $50 billion or $500 trillion. It doesn't make any difference as long as they balance. Yeah. But when, when I hear people say things like, oh, the gold was put into trust and you can get it back or you can claim it or whatever, what, what? I'm trying to get my head around that. What? How, how is that trust operating? Um, the, the gold well, didn't. Yes, trust should still contain the gold. If they got rid of the gold, well, then anything that's been transferred or converted into, then it should be still trust trust uh, property. Yeah. But there ain't nobody claiming it. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot to think about, man. Um, <laughs> but like you're always saying, you know, I mean, for me personally, the emphasis is not on the money anyway. I'm just trying to uh, True, because, you know, come out of slavery. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. He who comes into equity must be doing equity. If you want to ask for the gold, you better be doing what, you know, the equity requires to get the gold. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And the real gold is the knowledge of equity, not the actual gold. Yeah. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. Mm. The gold came out of the ground, and the ground was given to you freely. Everything that we have was really comes out of the ground, and the ground, nobody can claim ownership to of it because... I can see nowhere where God gave you ownership title to the ground. He retains ownership for his own benefit. He's given us control over the creation, the ground, and what we can take out of the ground, but has not given us ownership of the ground. He freely gave us the ground to use, possess, to have dominion over. Genesis chapter 3. But nobody has ownership. Only he owns it. So then, if we got it freely, then why aren't we giving it freely? No, we charge for it. Which is wrong. Yeah. God didn't say to Adam in the garden, you know, Adam, I'm going to give you all this stuff, and I'm going to pay you six ninety five an hour. Yeah. Tough to think about. Yeah, yeah. If we've received freely, why aren't we freely giving? Why are we charging people for things? Mm -hmm. Now, we can't feed people in Africa or starving countries because it's not economically viable to send stuff down there. It costs too much. But if we had a free society that everything didn't cost us anything then why wouldn't we be sending food down there? But not just food. Why would we be sending technology, how to plant seeds, how to create irrigation, how to build dams, how to build power plants, so that these people that don't have these things can have these things? Isn't that loving your brother as yourself? When we start thinking about that, when we start living equitable lives, by stop thinking it's a color issue, whether it's, Red, black, white, or yellow race. No, it's none of these things. It's the human race. We're all humans. We all bleed the same color blood. When we stop making a, a racial issue and we start loving all humankind, that would be doing equity. And then we could ask the Father anything we want according to his will, and we'd get it. In fact, you probably wouldn't have to ask for it. He'd probably bless you richly. 
You wouldn't have to operate under commercial needs, any venue, commercial venue. No commercial transactions necessary. God's kingdom does not operate on commerce. You don't have to buy nor sell anything. Jesus cast out the money changers. They were buying and selling in the temple. He says, my father's house doesn't do this. I'm just a crier in the wilderness. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of people listening. They just uh, they just don't call in, but yeah. What else have you got? Um, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Um, otherwise, I'll just be laboring the same points. Um. Yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. But I, I would recommend, though, um, people pulling up those PDFs I've, I've been talking about, the Chancery Courts in the UK, because um, most of it, more than 90% of it, is going to be applicable to wherever you are. And it lines up almost completely with what I've been listening to you say also, um, in terms of how to prepare your documents and how to conduct yourself and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, that's it, though. Um, so I'll speak to you next time. All right, appreciate you coming on. Good to be okay. a regular here. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying my best. <laughs> I I really appreciate that. Oh no, no, I appreciate. We appreciate you, Christian. Come on. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Thanks, sir. All right, who's next? Anybody got a question? Have uh, press star eight uh, to raise your hand. Star eight. Nobody? Got a clear board? Okay. Clear board, people. Anybody got questions? Press star eight. Star eight to raise your hand, ask a question. Star eight, anybody? Question? It's going to be a short night. Star eight, anybody? All right, we'll count them down. Star eight going once. Star 8, question. Press star 8, anybody? Star 8, going twice. Anybody? Star 8, question. Press star 8. Last call, star eight. Nobody? Okay, three times. I'd like to thank everybody for showing up, and we'll see you next week, same time, same channel. And everybody have a great week. Night all.